And thanks for uh, thanks to all of you for being here this evening. I had the pleasure and privilege of talking on my radio program this morning with Harun, and I don't know how many of you just out of curiosity happen to hear that. Well, we'll cover. <laughs> that's right. We're, we're going we're, we're gonna to cover different territory and go into some different areas uh, to be sure. Uh, although thought about this as sort of Act Two, uh, but there's a lot that his memoir generates and a lot of important themes and ideas uh, that certainly have to do with his background, but also with things that concern, I think, most of us and all of us uh, as parents, as, you know, in terms of our own background, and et cetera. Um, and I want to actually also talk to him about some of the work he's done in trying to build bridges between Muslims and Jews, because at the Jewish Community Center, this strikes me as an important thing for us to discuss. But before I even do that, you know, there's an old saw that uh, I try to live by when I do a radio program or an interview, and it has to do with starting off with something that's really particularly current. And I suspect some of you may know that what started out as a ban against those from Muslim countries has now been essentially given a stamp by the Supreme Court, only two dissenters, uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, and Justice Ginsburg. This is today's news, by the way. And I bring it up because this is the sort of thing that Harun was dealing with on a pretty strict basis when he was speaking as a representative of the Islamic community, right after 9-11, that all began, as some of you know, when he was just a young student and trying to find his own way in identity, speaking for Muslims and speaking about Muslims. I just want to get your reaction initially to this. Um, it, it, it comes off as not being an entire ban against Muslims because there are a couple of countries that have been added, North Korea and Venezuela. Um, the Trump administration, of course, has tried to, at least those who speak for it, sensibly has tried to say that this had nothing to do with a ban against Muslims specifically. But many people see it that way, and many people have reason to see it that way. So just your thoughts. Michelle. Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely puts a dent in North Korean tourism to the United States. So uh, <laughs> it's definitely a, definitely a, a very uh, alarming moment uh, for U.S.-North Korean relations, which were otherwise doing so well, uh, you know. Um, uh, and so that, that's something I think, uh, you know, that I lose an audience for the book as well, so I'm, I'm really concerned. Uh, the North Korean edition uh, was not published. So, uh, no, but it's interesting you say that uh, because actually uh, today also the news came out. So you mentioned the work I, I do in Muslim Jewish engagement. So one of the programs I, I help grow, which was mentioned in the beginning, uh, MLI, Muslim Leadership Initiative, uh, we bring Muslim leaders from all across the U.S. and Canada to, to study in Jerusalem. And uh, a few of them actually uh, WhatsApped me about an hour or two ago a story. They're from Jacksonville, Florida. And in Jacksonville, I don't know if you saw the news, uh, a man was arrested uh, planning a, a mass shooting at a mosque. So he was stopped before uh, this actually happened, but he had, he had basically told uh, a colleague or a friend that he intended to take a high-powered rifle to a mosque, climb on top of the roof, and uh, you know, uh, do whatever it is he had planned. And it, it is a very unsettling moment when, when you hear this, this kind of news in juxtaposition with the ban. And, and I think uh, that sense of trepidation, I'm sure a lot of minorities feel right now, where there's this, on the one hand, this feeling that you know, maybe this is just a, a burst of some of the ugly stuff we've had in our history, and it's going to go away. Uh, or maybe this is the new normal. And certainly for me, I have never before experienced, as an American, uh, this kind of anxiety where I really don't know where this is going um, or how ugly it's going to get. Uh, but it, it, it keeps me up at night. The irony is that the countries that were singled out initially as the Muslim countries, there's not one of them that had anybody that could be traced to terrorist activity here in the United States. In terms of those who came, there's migrants. I'm talking about Yemen and Chad and uh, a number of other countries that were on this list, Iran. Um, six were initially Muslim countries, both Sunni and Shia. But when you had to speak out and speak about these kinds of things, you were often almost put in that situation where you were supposed to be not only explaining but apologizing, like you were representing all Muslims. Uh, in many ways, what an uncomfortable position to have to be in, and what an extraordinarily onerous position to be in. I should have used it better in retrospect. I should have written everything I wrote, like Harun speaks on behalf of one and a half billion people. It would have been great, right? Can you imagine? I mean, I would have been on every panel or news show. I'm like, Donald Trump, like 330 million people, that's nothing, right? So, um, you know, uh, give or take like 270 million. Uh, but roughly, uh, 
I didn't, you know, can I say that? I don't know. Um, but uh, incidentally, I did say this Friday night, but it, it is so nice to be in California uh, because when, when, you know, it's late at night on election night, you guys roll through like the cavalry with your 55 electoral votes, and it's such a good feeling, right? Like it's automatically you see the number like shoot up, but not high enough, um, but you know, that's what happens when you have Facebook. Um, that was a joke. I know probably half of you work for Facebook. Um, it's okay. You can take it. It's fine. It's, it's totally cool. You notice how um, funny he can be? I told. I mean, I don't know this how this is going to be sustained, but I told him before we came on, and I mentioned to some other people who were there that, and read his book. Also, I wrote a book about humor. He's a funny guy. Sorry. So yeah, I think. So yeah, I mean, you know, what you're referencing is, I, I think, a feeling that a lot of people get, where they look at you and they say, "Well, you're part of X group." And therefore, you must be an expert on all these topics and all these issues. And for me, uh, it, it was such a strange moment. I, was, I got very active in the Muslim community at NYU, where I went to college. And uh, I was, it was the first time I was in uh, a space where there were Muslims my age. And so you know, college is obviously a time where you're exploring yourself and you're trying to figure out your place in the world. And for me, it was very much this chance to learn about being Muslim. And it was the first time I'd encountered different types of Muslims, Sunni, Shia, uh, more conservative, more progressive, uh, different ethnic origins, people who had converted to Islam, people who were born into Islam. And I threw myself into, uh, for lack of a better term, community organizing. And, and I loved the work, even as I struggled with a lot of social anxiety. And uh, I ended up getting elected president of, of our Muslim Student Association. We called it the Islamic Center at NYU. And from my freshman year to my senior year, it had grown uh, tremendously. And I thought, you know, and this is sort of an interesting way of putting this, I, I was, my first day of the new semester, the fall, we had planned this big event where we were going to, literally we, were, we, we booked the biggest venue on campus, we were going to try to invite everyone we could. We snuck into every dorm we could and we put up posters advertising the Islamic Center at NYU. And the next day was 9-11. And, you know, suddenly I'm a 21-year-old kid who, you know, has, I mean, was if there were more than 10 people in a room, I was freaking out, right? So, and all of a sudden, you're, I'm representing the, the largest Muslim community in proximity to Ground Zero that had any kind of facility with media that was comfortable in English. And that's where that, as you, you, know, as you said earlier today, the professional Muslim thing came in, where everyone was looking to us and, and to many other Muslims across the country uh, to explain what had happened as if we ourselves were not in that city the same day and scared of the very same things and affected by the same things. And it was assumed that somehow that didn't affect us. Our only role was to make other people feel better about themselves. And that's the professional Muslim. But the, 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 one of the great ironies for somebody in your, that was put in your position is the attack on 9-11 really came from those who were schooled particularly in a specific kind of Islam, Wahhabism. You know, and many of the most of them were from Saudi Arabia. Uh, one Egyptian, of course, and, and uh, one, uh, I believe, uh, another national. Um, but uh, North Korean. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, it, it, suddenly you're put in this role of having to speak about a very specific kind of Islam as if you are not necessarily embracing it, but you are the representative of it. And you're kind of, uh, the kind of Islam that you were raised in, I assume it was Pakistani, your background. It mm -hmm. had, very little to do with that kind of Saudi Wahhabism or Wahhabism, although they certainly spread it throughout the Pakistan uh, and Punjabian world. But nevertheless, this was something that had nothing to do with you, really, did it? Well, I mean, to, to give you an example, and I'm sure uh, American Muslims are just very American, so we tend to love our religion and know nothing about it. Uh, so uh, <laughs> was it John Stewart who once said that 45% of Americans can't find America on a map of America? Uh, so. <laughs> You know, and you know. So the reason I bring this up is I remember um, the 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 student who became my my roommate my sophomore and junior year. We were allowed to pick roommates at NYU, and if you you know you lucked out, you got the roommate you wanted. Uh, I, I remember the first time I met him. I met him at the Islamic Center, and he was praying, and he was praying weird, right? Like I was like, what does he do? Like he just, someone did they just got to pray, right? Like his hands were in the wrong place. He just he was Shia. They'd never met a Shia Muslim before. I'd never even seen Shia Muslims pray. And so, you know, this is very much this exposure to these different types of Islam that I had no prior experience in except vague allusions to. 
And then, like you said, suddenly someone's asking a very specific question about an ideology when, I mean, probably you didn't really even investigate your own religious identity that seriously. I mean, it was important to you and you struggled with it and all of those things, but certainly it was on the ne never on the level of, uh, you know, what are the political implications of this ideology when your primary concern is like getting a date. And that's a big concern in your memoir. It is, yeah. But so. Let me go back, take you back to 9-11 though because a lot of uh, Muslims that I knew and that I interviewed after that, and it was a, a very important uh, responsibility I felt to hear these voices and to have a rather large audience we have on NPR hear these voices because uh, you know there were these terrible things that were happening to people who were of the Islamic faith. Um, and uh, there, there are things that I don't identify, and I'm sure you don't identify with America, what America stands for. What I wonder about is if you had, especially now that you're working with relations between Muslims and Jews, there used to be a much greater sense of Jews feeling that they were pressed with this dual loyalty notion. Are you going to be loyal to Israel or your Jewish faith as opposed to America? Suddenly this was creeping into the whole discourse with Muslims in America. It must have somehow gotten into your whole discourse too, didn't it? Well, absolutely. I, I, I find sometimes the, the lack of familiarity with, with uh, you know, the very fact that if you're, you know, you are where you live, seems to strike people by surprise. And so there's, people have this really hard time getting their heads around, oh, like I live here, I don't live there, I can't speak authoritatively to there, and I don't have the right to do that. Uh, but I, I do think that, you know, this moment also brings out the positive in people. And, and I do think that especially in this specific moment, uh, and, and if I'm to be spiritual about it, I, I think that you know God creates certain moments, so to speak, or, or allows certain moments to come to pass because they reveal who people really are. And you know, I'll give you a, a very specific example of this on 9/11. I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of us remember that day where we were that day. It's one of those things we won't forget. And so for me in New York, I mean, you you see the towers collapse. I mean, it's it's in front of you. And my brother actually worked in one of the towers. And so at this point, I'm just completely freaking out. Like, I have no idea what to do. And I remember turning to a friend and saying exactly that, like, what do we do now? And he looks at me flabbergasted, and he's like, well, you're president of the Islamic Center. You figure it out, right? <laughs> so I was like, damn it. Um, so I didn't, I, didn't, uh, I didn't, I wish I had an email scandal. I wouldn't have been president. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, it's funny because it's true. So, uh, so you know, I, I remember thinking to myself, okay, there's no trains running in, in New York, and so I'll go to the prayer space we have. And maybe I'll meet other students and, and we'll try to figure out what we're supposed to do in this moment because everyone is looking for someone to reach out to and, and try to understand what happened. And speaking of Muslim Jewish work, Muslim Jewish relations on campus at NYU were not particularly good. Um, I had a fair amount to do with that, being you know, completely honest. They were pretty testy. Israel-Palestine um, was not just an issue on which we disagreed, but we kind of bludgeoned each other with. And uh, you know, I remember I, I went to the prayer space, and there's no Muslims there, but there's a modern Orthodox Jewish student whose name was Israel. Uh, he was Sephardic. He's from Argentina. Um, he's standing there, and I'm like, you know, like that's not, you know, like of all the people I would imagine there is like it was not going to be him. And I, I said to him, "What are you doing here?" And I trying to sort of very subtly indicate like perhaps you don't want to be in this particular space right now. And I'll never forget, and this is about, I don't know, like noon on 9-11. And he says to me, I realized that some of the Muslim students might feel uncomfortable walking home alone today. So if I walked with them, maybe people would think twice about saying something if they saw a guy with them in a kippah, like he was wearing it, you know. And I remember thinking to myself, like, wow. It utterly floored me that the first person there in a gesture of solidarity was a person who you know, we had had all these public spats uh, with. And so I do think that you know, there's, in a roundabout way, there's the pressure that comes out of it. And sometimes it's, it's onerous and it's difficult. But there's also the flip side of it is that you see kind of who people really are. It's a wonderful, hopeful story. Um, but then. You know, we deal with the fact that there's so much enmity between Muslims and Jews. And I wonder if there's a way that you have gone about, especially through your work for the Shalom Hartman uh, Institution, to ameliorate some of that, to reduce some of that. I mean, distrust, 
particularly where Israel is concerned, even hatred, you know, um, and the feeling that this is this is our enemy on both sides. Yeah, and and you know, I think it's it's. Uh, it's a particularly unique moment to do this. So the program that I, I work on started uh, about four years ago where uh, an imam in North Carolina had this idea about, uh, basically, it's, it's kind of funny. Hartman is a, is a center of Jewish learning. It's based in Jerusalem. It has a North America office. It's the Shalom Hartman Institute. And uh, all of you should go there, but donate to the JCC first. Um, but um, you know, it's, I, was, I was not told to say that. Uh, so. Um, so, you know, anyway, they do programs for, for Jewish leaders, lay leaders, religious leaders, for Christian leaders. And this imam said, what if I bring you Muslim leaders, will you teach them? And Hartman's response was, yeah, sure, because they were like, no one's going to come, right? So we don't have to do anything, right? It's just like completely like there's no, nothing comes out of this. And lo and behold, 16 of us showed up in Jerusalem and, not, and with no idea what to expect. And, you know, probably in the back of our minds, we were thinking, this is going to fail. It's not going to work. We've tried this before. And, and basically, the program, I think, is so unique because rather than kind of dance around the elephant in the room, we you know, go straight for it. And we say, what are the issues that actually divide us? And, and one of the ideas out of this program is to say exactly to your point, we're not going to agree on everything. We're going to disagree very strongly sometimes. But can we do a few things? The first is, can we disagree in a way where we don't demonize each other? So we can, you know, without descending into anti-Semitism, can we say, I'm critical of this, or I don't agree with that? Can we see people as fully human and then understand that their identity is rich and complicated and leads them to positions that we may not agree with, but it's their humanity that's leading them there? And the final point is, you know, there are things that we should be working on. And, you know, you, I mean, you know, we talked about this earlier uh, on the show. In this moment right now, when there's so much animosity being directed at both of our communities. I mean, what a tragedy it would be if we can't find a way to say, OK, we have some issues that divide our communities internally and between each other. The most tragic but, thing of all is that Israelis and Palestinians aren't even talking to each other. I mean, yeah. particularly those in Gaza, but certainly in the West Bank as well. I mean, there's a kind of exclusion that's going on on both sides that keeps them from recognizing the humanity in each other that you're talking about, yeah. which is you know, something that we can idolize and hope to reach or achieve in some ways, but there's so much of that distance now. And I was wondering, you know, in a conversation this morning, you were saying, uh, I want to talk about your memoir, but you're saying that you were in favor of a one-state solution, yeah. which was kind of surprising. It was kind of jolting when Trump came out with the same remark early on, you may recall, and now we're having him. The safest yeah. place to hide, after all. Well, you know. yeah. But um, it brings up, you know, you know, the counter argument to that is a one state solution means that there will be an Arab majority, uh, that the, a place that was supposed to be a Jewish state will not cease to exist. So it's a kind of suicide for the Jewish homeland. That's the argument, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard. Now, how do you reconcile that kind of argument? You're trying to talk and be on the same wavelength and recognize each other as human beings to the reality of people claiming the same land and believing that they are destined in their narratives to own that land and th that land to be their land. Yeah, so I, I'd say two things. The first is uh, when, when I say that you know, we see each other's humanity, it's that we can disagree without believing that this, this disagreement is motivated by desire to harm the other. So if I look at an issue, and this is not about my work with Hartman. This is my own opinion as someone who's spent sort of years now looking at analyzing the Middle East, is I can say I think this solution is more effective. And someone can turn around and say, no, I think a two-state solution is more effective. But I don't see that person as intending any kind of harm. I see this as an honest disagreement, right? No different than I would love that we could get to a point in the United States where we could talk about something like health care. And obviously, it's an imperfect analogy in, in many ways. But in the sense that right now in a polarized environment, Democrats don't look at Republicans and say, hey, you're people with different ideas, but you have good intentions for the country, right? And so we, we tend to see each other as enemies. And what I love about the process at Hartman is that we will have debates. And pretty much every at Hart, everyone at Hartman disagrees with me on this, right? Naturally, right? But it, it never goes to the point of saying, hey, you're a bad person because you think this. Or you're motivated by a desire to see me hurt. It's, instead, it's basically, you know, OK, we have a disagreement. And we can argue about it. But there's a certain humanity to the debate, which is unfortunately lacking. And when I said what I said, I said the reason I said that is because I simply believe that the fate of Israelis and Palestinians is intertwined. 
I don't believe in a, in a one-state solution that denies people their collective identity. I believe in something closer to a confederation. Because I just don't see that there's any way for these people to survive without each other. That they're interlinked. And whether they want to be or not, that's a reality. Uh, I certainly don't believe that that implies imposing an identity on another people or denying them their right to collective expression. Um, I actually think that basically what, what's happening right now is an imperfect one-state solution. That they are, the Israelis and Palestinians are linked to each other, whether they want to be or not. That's the reality. And it's something that, you know, I, it comes out of a very personal experience. My family is Pakistani, right? There was a partition of the Indian subcontinent. And in many ways, Indians and Pakistanis cannot get along, right? They fought several wars. Um, there's a lot of enmity on both sides. There's been a lot of violence. But their fates are intertwined. And at some point, you know, when hopefully things turn for the better, they will be able to recognize that common fate without forcing themselves to collapse into each other, right? Like there are Pakistanis and there are Indians, but that they can work together. And that's my hope. It's, it's a, um, it seems to be a very sanguine view. Um, and I hope the one that will be uh, brought to order in some fashion. I'm just reminded, though, when you mentioned Pakistan, of just how much uh, enmity there has been over Kashmir and so many other things between Pakistan and India. And when you think about Islam in Pakistan versus Islam in India, you're talking about two couldn't be more different, I mean, in terms of the situations, even though come from the same wellspring and so forth. And how do we get past, uh, I'd like your thoughts on this, some of these stereotypes right here at home in the United States um, about Muslims. Uh, the idea that many Americans have that Muslims want to take over our Constitution and turn it into Sharia or who knows what they're thinking, you know, in different parts of Trumpsville. Um, I mean, I can't read those minds, but I know there's a lot of antipathy and there's a lot of Islamophobia and there's a lot of stereotyping and, frankly, hatred mm -hmm. that is very difficult to get past. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's interesting you point this out because I, and I'm sure a lot of us feel this way when we're asked to, or we're sort of made to, to represent an entire people and, and people say ridiculous things. Uh, you get this with anti-Semitic tropes all the time, like all Jews are this, and, and it's always a nefarious thing and it's a conspiratorial thing. And, you know, Islamophobia functions in some very similar ways. And sometimes my response to it is just, I'm like, I'm sarcastic and snarky, right? So when you mentioned the Sharia thing, there's been a campaign in 23 states to ban Sharia, which is interesting because the United States fundamentally does not allow for religious law, like we are a secular country, right? Like you don't need to rewrite the Constitution for the Constitution to be in effect. But the funny thing is that the campaign started in Oklahoma. And it was like, if we were gonna take over the country, why would we start in Oklahoma, <laughs> right? Like we would start, we would want a seaport, right, naturally, because you don't want to get yourself surrounded from the get-go, right? That's not a good idea. We'd want a seaport, probably a land border with Canada, right? Something, you know, um, or maybe Mexico, I don't know. Um, I would think we'd start with, like, Maine, you know? Maybe Washington State. And uh, don't please quote me on that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the real thing is, and, and this is what's kind of scary, is that, you know, when, when people live in boxes, they, they end up... Uh, thinking things about each other that are really dangerous. And, and the reality is when you're a tiny community where 1% of the United States, most Americans have no idea. I mean, I think Obama said it quite well. He was at the Islamic Society of Baltimore uh, in, in February in his last year in office. He said something interesting. He said most Americans don't know a Muslim or don't know that they know a Muslim. Right? So most Americans don't associate Muhammad Ali with Islam, or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, or Malcolm X, or Barack Obama himself, right? But he's a <laughs> secret Muslim, right? So um, that's, always, that's always the case. But so then what happens is you get, you get that kind of stereotyping. And honestly, I'm, I'm just expressing kind of frustration and, and confusion. I, I don't quite know what we do about this. Because sometimes it's, it's easy to look out and say, OK, maybe this is well-intentioned ignorance. And it's our responsibility to go out and, and meet people and talk to them. But then you see what happened in Charlottesville. And then you're like, well, maybe this isn't well-intentioned ignorance. And, and it really, and this is, this is what's so testy about this moment, a lot depends on whether we read this moment right or not. And, and if this is a moment where people are anxious and scared, and so they, they turn to sources they can't verify and they have no context for, then one approach is called for. But if this is a moment where a certain kind of, you know, frankly, those folks were Nazis, right? They weren't, I don't know what I call them neo-Nazis, right? They were Nazis. And if that's what's really rising on the margins, then how we respond is different. 
And I don't know, I'm just confessing, you know, helplessness, since I don't know which one of these two it is. Well, it's a battle, and, and there are many mountains for us to climb. But you went through your own battles. So let's get to the memoir. I mean, uh, your youth was quite a battle. Uh, had parents who expected a great deal of piety and observance from you as a religious, um, as, as being devoted Muslims themselves, wanting you to follow pretty much the Quran and what they had to teach you as a young man. Um, and a lot of this, your, your nature was bridling against. Uh, I'm not even talking about you know, um, struggling with lust like most adolescent boys, but just a basic sense of wanting to liberate your spirit and struggling with the whole idea of Allah and God and how important uh, he was to you. So let's kind of trace this in terms of your spiritual development because um, in many ways, you went a long way to Dubai before you had that enlightenment that made perfect sense to you. And in some ways, let me, let me just see if I can frame this. Um, when you were on this morning, uh, you know, there were a lot of people who responded to, enjoyed hearing you and, and felt illuminated by hearing you and all the rest of that. But somebody said, this is a real American way that he found his way back to, you know, just like, love yourself. It sounds almost like it came from an imam. But in many ways, it sounds like American pop culture in a strange way. This, yeah. is, this is a comment of one of the listeners from this morning's program. And I thought, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and I think for a lot of folks, uh, that's, that's very much the journey we're on. Uh, you know, American Islam is, I mean, we've been here for a very long time, obviously. But institutionally speaking, I mean, there's basically these two, two large segments of American Islam. You have African-American Muslims. And, and their history goes back to the early 20th century. Some would argue much farther back, but certainly the, the, the big movement you know, grows in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And then Muslims of, for lack of a better term, recent immigrant origin, right? So folks who come from Pakistan, like my family, from Egypt or Turkey or, or what have you. And so you've got these two different you know, kind of communities. And so for, for my experience from within that community, it was very much trying to figure out your own religious language, right? So. My parents took religion very seriously. They, they expected me and my brother to take religion very seriously. But I was looking for a kind of Islam that resonated with me and my experience. And so it took me a very long time. I'm Islam probably, or spiritual sustenance? Uh, I think both. They, I think they both. went together. Yeah, yeah, I think they, they did and they do. And I'm probably the only person who's ever had a come to Jesus moment in Dubai. But um, <laughs> you know, I like to be, I like to be contrarian. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's no different from, from, you know, a lot of other communities and a lot of coming-of-age stories. I think what made it so complicated was that at the same time I'm, you know, 21, 22 years old trying to figure this out, like, I'm under a microscope. And, and people are expecting me and my community to, to talk about and think about things that we were not really ready for. And I do wonder now, if you're a Muslim who's, you know, 17, 18, 19 years old and you're in, in America right now, how different your identity must be. Right, that that you've got a president who, as you said today, you know, is, is openly retweeting, like virulently anti-Muslim content, and you've got people just running. Just retweeted for office. this stuff from England first. Yeah, is, exactly. Which is based on complete fiction, really. I mean, video taken. I don't know how many of you have been following a story in the Netherlands and places that have nothing to do with the Islamic world. Sorry. No, no, not at all. And so I, I think that that it to me, it, I, I one of the reasons I wanted to write this is because I. I wanted to give us room, you know, as, as Muslims and, and uh, as people who take their religion seriously, wherever that takes us, to just have those conversations. Because right now there's so little room to actually take Islam seriously without descending into national security, foreign policy, terrorism, extremism, all of which are important things to talk about. But that's, I mean, there's so much more to human beings than those things. And, and where's the space for that? Well, you had to deal with your own multidimensionality, really, and things like bipolar. You make me sound like a Star Trek character. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's right. <laughs> kind of cool, yeah. Um, no, I mean, and I respect the struggles you went through. I mean, the, the memoir begins with uh, Arun really thinking of taking his own life. What comes across, though, is that sense of feeling in, in despair because you're not measuring up above all. And that feeling somehow, and a lot of us went through this at different phases of our lives, I suppose. But it's, you were supposed to be obedient. That's a great primacy of Islam belief. You know, that you must be obedient to not only what the Quran teaches, but to Allah, to your parents, to all of these sorts of guideposts in your life. And it was to some extent your feeling that you were moving away from that obedience that was really, I think, tormenting you, wasn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, my parents were very, very religious, and, and they did teach us quite a lot about the religion. I don't begrudge them that at all. Uh, but for me personally, it was really hard because it was sort of like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, and this is where I'm at. And I experienced that gap as evidence of the fact that I was going to burn in hell. Right? And, and I'm sure a lot of people, you know, grow up feeling this, and then it's this, it's this terrible feeling where, you know, you, you feel like you're, you're a failure. And the, the funny thing is that, you know, we don't have a lot of resources in a lot of communities of faith to talk about this stuff. So when you go to someone, they're like, oh, you should just pray more, which is basically telling someone who's like at the end of their rope that, hey, like God hates you too, right? Like, so, you know, you hate yourself, but God hates you too. Don't worry about it, right? At least you guys are finally on the same page. So um, I never thought of it that way, actually. That's deep, right? That's interesting. That's my next book, right? God hates you too. Um, like uh, a self-help handbook. Um, but it's it's so true. And how and, to be know, a Muslim sounds like self. You know. You know like, the funny thing is there's the title sounds like you're teaching us how to be a Muslim. It's the, so the funny thing is that right now I looked on Amazon because I never do that. Um, but I wanted to see you know who wrote me nasty reviews and and whether I can you know find some way to undermine their careers. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I wouldn't. I would never do that. So what's interesting though is that I saw that people who bought this book um, often bought. You know they say like buy together, right? It's hillbilly elegy. We were just like, wow, that's really cool because that's like a book that's taken really seriously. But when the book first came out, the book that was most often bought with it was like A is for Allah, right? Which probably means that people saw the book and thought it was like, oh, it's like teaching you how to be Muslim, right? And then they bought it and they read it and they were like, oh, dear God, right? And they were like, <laughs> this is not real. So there was clearly this transition where they went from like children's Islam book to like collapse of Appalachia, right? So somehow there was this transition in there. I don't know exactly what happened, but you're right. The title... It's supposed to be tongue in cheek, but a lot of people, I think, don't quite understand that. But your background, I mean, your parents were educated people. They were both physicians. Um, you grew up in a, obviously, assimilated. You were never excluded because of your Islam, even though you were the only Muslim in your school and uh, the only dark young man in your school. Uh, but the, nevertheless, your, your parents um, gave you a kind of Islam which made you feel that you couldn't repair yourself somehow, that you didn't have the tools to do that. Everything was in Allah's hands. Yeah. yeah, I think it was, you know, the way I internalized and the way I was, I, I felt I was taught religion was in this very mechanical way. And I never really thought that I understood the point of the religion, right? Like, I understood that you're supposed to do X, Y, and Z, like a checklist. But it's hard to take a checklist and make it feel like it's anything but a checklist, right? Um, it's as if you were to set up a to-do list for every day of your life you would nevertheless start to wonder, like, what is the actual purpose of my life? Like, it's nice that I'm exercising every day or checking my emails on time or, or what have you, but what is, the, what is the underlying purpose of my life? And it's only when my life fell apart, um, when I was about 31, 32, and kind of, you know, went south very fast, uh, that I, I was actually forced to grapple with the fact that I didn't really have any idea what religion was supposed to do for me. And it was the process of picking up those pieces that allowed me to go back to religion and say, what is this actually going to do for me? And, and where do I fit into this conversation? Well, you found that to some degree, haven't you? I think so. I mean, I, I think it's very much a work in progress. But um, I think falling apart and, and losing my way and losing a lot of things in my life, uh, unexpectedly, um, but rather pleasantly, all things considered, allowed me a new appreciation of a lot of the things I have. and uh, and and the value of things in my life that I don't think I ever would have seen. The writing help to illuminate? Oh, absolutely. I think writing actually saved my life. If it wasn't for writing this book, it was a very personal thing. It was, like you said, the book opens with me actively suicidal. And so if I hadn't, if I hadn't had the outlet of writing and trying to make sense of myself, I don't know how I would have gone through it otherwise. And you realize, I'm sure, because you've heard this, how much your story resonates with people Think about a lot of the Orthodox Jews I know who went through very similar kind of odysseys in their lives, but people, evangelicals, people of all faiths, yeah. Absolutely, and one of the, I mean, one of the things that I find so fascinating about Hartman and the work we do is that the, the more I get to study and learn from Jewish scholars and actually like dive into a tradition is how remarkably similar our religions are. And I don't mean that in some sort of flippant, like, yay, homos, right? Like, that's cool, like, that's very nice. But in the sense that, you know, we're, we're struggling with very similar things. And we're trying to deal with very similar conversations. And so in many cases, our communities aren't just, aren't just experiencing the same things, but we end up as allies in the same experience. I mean, in, in places like Europe, for example, you, know, you, you can't get kosher meat in some places. right? There's, there's actually attempts to ban Jewish life. 
right? Which is funny because it's like on the one hand, you can't deny the Holocaust, right? And on the other hand, you're actively trying there to deny people, people the right. To do that. There are plenty of people, yeah, here and there. You know, some of them are, you know, showing up in, in our, our feed now and Facebook and whatnot. But it, it's, it's there, right? And so it's like, okay, there's that history. And then there's even just what it means to be a religious person. And in many senses, I think because of the similarity of our religions, I do think that Muslims have a lot to learn from the experiences of Jewish communities historically and presently. Uh, but you can only get that learning if you can, you know, push the walls down a little bit and actually get to engage with people. Well, I know you've tried assiduously to kind of stay away from politics, and that's smart. There's, there's wisdom in that. What do you say, though, to Muslims, and, and some of them, of course, are American Muslims, who say you have to keep these identities separate because American public, uh, American policy, governmental policy, has been directly responsible for the death of Muslims. I mean, the Iraq war was pretty much in that vein, in that context, by many who were opposed to it, of Muslim faith and not of Muslim faith as well, you know, saying this is a government that's responsible for the killing of Muslims, therefore we should retaliate or we should do something about that. What, what's, what's your response to that? You know, I, the American Muslim community, the, the arc that I've seen is, is such an interesting one. I think in 2000, um, talk about ironies, 74% uh, of American Muslims voted for George W. Bush. And, uh, and you know, this was, a, this was a major fissure in the American Muslim community because overwhelmingly black Muslim me communities. Room, the majority of American white women voted for Donald Trump. I mean, so in conclusion, kind of Donald Trump is supported by Muslims. Um, like if you draw the, like it's a syllogism sort of thing, right? That made no sense. That was, sometimes jokes fail. Um, it's okay, right? It's, we're allowed to do that, right? Um, I'll, yeah, I won't go back there. Um, but it's interesting, right? So, so I mean, you know, 74% and there's this fissure opens up. And in 2012, about 89% of American Muslims voted for Barack Obama. So that was like a nice 12-year arc, right? Um, but, you know, the, the thing that I, I see as so disheartening is that I, I worked for a while in national security. And I remember, um, you know, during some of the conversations that we had around Iran and around the Middle East, when I would make an intervention in those debates, people wouldn't see me as someone who had an opinion, right? That could be grounded in fact that you could debate with. It was just like, oh, he's brown and he's Muslim, so obviously he's going to have a different opinion. And I think that's where I think people who, people need to get involved and engaged because if you, if you know something or you have insight or you have experience, and it's not just I have insight because I'm Muslim, it's that this is what I was focusing on, this is what I was studying, this is what I was learning, there, this is what I was experiencing, allows me to then intervene in a conversation. And when we reduce people to identities, we actually take away our ability to have more intelligent conversations. And I think the Iraq war is a perfect example of that. I mean, there were people who were maybe politically marginal who said, this is a disaster. Like, what are we doing? And, and we didn't hear those voices because we limited who could be in the room. I wanted to bring questions forward. Um, I know some of you have put questions down on, uh, on cards. And I'll, uh, is that is that way we're doing things, Ronit? Or am I calling on people? How did you want? Oh, you have cards. OK. Um, if you just pass them over, we'll try to get to as many as we can. I just had one other question, though. Um, I was intrigued when we were, before we came up here and started our conversation. It's been a kind of things that I, I say, working in, in uh, broadcast journalism all these years, I'm amazed sometimes the way things cluster. And Reza Aslan was on the forum program on Friday. I just do four days a week, but with the host, Friday host, Mina Kim. This morning, Harun was on. And tomorrow, uh, in the 9 o'clock hour, Kizer Khan will be the guest. And Kizer Khan is the gold star father whose son was a captain uh, during the war in Iraq and who was killed and who, of course, as many of you remember, appeared at the uh, Democratic National Convention, uh, essentially giving his copy of the Constitution of the United States to Donald Trump, which he had carried in his pocket for most of his life in America. Very dedicated and, and strong, patriotic American man. Um, and you said you had a Kieser Khan story. So you intrigued me with that. So it's not, it's not, it's a, not story. a promo for the forum program. It's not at I all. Just, um, I was just curious about what the story is. Also, donate to the JCC. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, it's, it's not a story featuring Khizr Khan. It's a story about Khizr Khan and how people experience him. So I'll give, you, like, I'll give you what it's like to be, for those of you who don't know what it's like to be Pakistani Muslim in America, 
Um, and this is a very South Asian thing. So Pakistanis, Indians, Bengalis, it's sort of a very common experience of constantly feeling like you're a failure, right? So I told my dad I was writing a book, and he looked at me like, if it doesn't sound like medical school, I don't care, right? <laughs> so that's, that's rule one, right? If you're not a doctor, you've let everyone down. And um, this is where there's a lot in common with Jews. Yeah, it's the same thing, or you're not a doctor, right? So this is, this is how amazing actually, it is, my wife right? Called, my, wife's husband, uh, my wife's uncle said, you're the wrong kind of doctor. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, PhD doesn't count. Like, what, is, what the hell is that, right? You can't prescribe medication, you're useless. That's right. Um, so, you know, so I told my dad I was writing a book, and he's like, uh, like, he just kind of grunted and went back to watching. I think he was watching bowling at the time, which was more interesting than my book. Um, no offense if you bowl. I mean, that's your fault. So, um, <laughs> And then, you know, like about a year later, he's like, just out of nowhere, he's like, where's your book? And I was like, well, you know, it takes a long time to write. And, you know, for a writer, when someone's like, where's your book? You get all defensive. You're like, actually, right? I'm trying to, you know, whatever. Um, so I, you know, I said, well, it takes a long time to write a book. It's not like an easy exercise. Looks at me and says, Bill Clinton's book got published in six months. <laughs> I said to him, Bill Clinton was president of the United States of America. He said, why can't you be president? So that's what it's like. And so the Chisar Khan story, this is the funny thing that that's, uh, a, a number of us noted. And, and God bless him, I think what he did was amazing at the DNC. I'm not trying to undercut that. But the funny thing is that the way he harangued Donald Trump, and this is the ultimate definition of white privilege. Every immigrant kid gets that speech every night. <laughs> Who are you? What have you done? You've sacrificed nothing and no one. Like you're a complete failure. You can't go to medical school. Like you've disappointed everyone in the family. You'll be ashamed for generations. Sometimes they wave the Quran instead of the Constitution, but it's the same thing, right? And Trump got like five seconds of this and had a nuclear meltdown, right? <laughs> we get this every day. Immigrants would be much better presidents because we can handle stress. This guy gets like 10 seconds and he lost his mind. So that's all I had to say. That was my Khazar Khan. One, one just quick rejoinder to that is one of the most appalling things about that whole episode was this is a man who said, I sacrificed my son for this country, yeah. which he did. And Trump said, I too have sacrificed. I'm thinking, what the hell have you sacrificed? I'm sorry. But I mean, you know, he was growing up, he grew up in a, a bubble of billionaire. Uh, and so he and, and the, the young man he calls Rocket Man over in North Korea have a great deal in common. You know, they both had everything they wanted and they both. Uh, were essentially completely spoiled in this kind of solipsistic way. Uh, Trump did lose a brother. I mean, his brother died of alcoholism. Sure, but sure. He had nothing to do with that sacrifice. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Khizr Khan and his wife lost a son. Yeah, and it's not the first time he's done it. I mean, he's he's mocked veterans. Yes. Over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so, seeing yes, hands go up. We're Bernie, going to take questions. That I just want to ask no statements uh, or essays. Questions, please. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, my former student, Wynn's hand, went up first, which was always a, 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 took a class from me at Stanford, and he was always the one who came. Plus, he calls in my radio program. I'm not trying to give you a special privilege or anything here, Wynn. And Michael expected me to ask a question, so I don't want to disappoint him. Um, I woke up this morning without realizing what a wonderful day was going to be, and I turned on to forum, as I usually do, and after the first hour, you were on. And I said, I got other things I was going to do. But somehow, in about a minute or so, you hooked me into listening and got me so convinced that not only were you bright and intelligent to listen to, that I wanted to see another hour with you, which brought me here. Now, having said that, I don't expect that you'll be the spokesman for the Palestinians or anybody else. But I had two things that came to mind, and I wanted to ask it very quickly as questions. One, do you think that the Shia Sunni fights which are so miserable and terrible, are going to overwhelm any possibility of the Palestinians and the Israels even getting together to talk about something. And um, the second thing was, I cringe every time I hear that there's a new settlement opening up. But I don't know how the Palestinians really view all this. If you could help me understand that, I'd appreciate it. One of my colleagues at Hartman, actually, let me rewind. First of all, thank you so much for the kind words. I don't know if that I deserve them, but I appreciate that you, you know, listening and coming out. Um, one of my colleagues at Hartman uh, said something once which I found so brilliant. And, and so, you know, it, it both captures the, the, the pain of the conflict and then the challenge of resolving it. And he said that, you know, Jewish and Muslim communities unintentionally um, often press upon the most sensitive wounds in their collective, each other's collective psyche. So many Muslim communities, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally, um, 
inflict or resurrect or, or propagate some of the worst anti-Semitic tropes, right? Sometimes vocally and, and obviously and intentionally and, and sometimes without realizing it, right? So this sort of sense is like now there's a Jewish state and yet we're still not accepted. There's still this, you know, th th this language of, of violence and, and, you know, I mean, the most egregious example obviously is Iran, but there's this sort of spectrum. And so for a lot of Israelis, as he put it, you know, the language out of the Muslim world whatever the intention evokes or reminds of the Holocaust. And for many Muslims, the language of Zionism evokes the experience of colonialism, which is our greatest historical trauma for the 20th century. And so, you know, the, the, the irony of this is that two communities that have gone through really intense traumas are now worried that that trauma will be revisited on each other. And that's what I think makes it so hard to process this. And, and you know, I, I'm very conscious of where I, I stand is a, is a strange place. And sometimes, frankly, it's scary. Uh, and, and so, you know, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, when I was at, at Hartman about a year and a half ago, I was at the Mahon, the Institute in, in Jerusalem, and I was, I was teaching there. And we went to Ramallah one day. And uh, what does one do in Ramallah except I, I went to get a haircut because I was there for several hours. But I, you know, I like that because you get to talk to people and you get to, you're actually just, you know, you're hanging out with people. And I speak some Arabic and so I was talking to folks. And one of the barbers who was, he, the guy who was cutting my hair, you know, that's obviously takes a long time. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he said to me, he said to me, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm, I'm visiting Jerusalem. And he said, I've never been, I'm not allowed to go. And I thought to myself, I'm not Middle Eastern, I'm not Arab, I'm certainly not Palestinian, I'm a Pakistani American, you know, and I can, I, I just went. And he's never been. And he's not very far away at all. And that was heartbreaking. And then a couple days later, I taught a class for, Hartman has this program called Havruta, which is sort of like a gap year program. And they bring North American Jews to study with Israeli Jews together in Israel. Um, and most of the, uh, Israeli students are in their gap year before they go on and join the IDF, right? So, you know, I engaged with them and I had this amazing evening for, for two or three hours where I talked about my story, they talked about their story, we talked about, you know, some of the challenges they have in their life. I think they really appreciated the topics because, you know, these things resonated with them. And I thought to myself, I'm in this really weird place where I'm in between. And I can, like, I want those kids to, to, to have a like good lives. And I want that Palestinian to have a good life. And right now we're in this moment as, as a country, and I would argue in parts of the world, you mentioned the Sunnithia thing, where it's like either or, right? You, you can only be American or Muslim, right? You can either only be American or Jewish, right? Like a real American is white, Aryan, you know, so on and so forth, right? So I feel like the work I'm doing is really important, but it's also a little bit scary because you're sort of like afraid you're kind of in the middle, and, and you, you know, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to emphasize the and instead of the or. So I don't know if that, that speaks to what you were saying, but I hope it captures a little bit of it. Well, I've got a, a question that's apropos and kind of dovetails with, uh, in certain ways, with Wynn's question. You said, quote, Muslims have a lot to learn from Jews. What can Jews learn from Muslims? That's a very good question. Uh, you can learn how not to work shoe racks, because we can't figure that out. When you, know, when you take your shoes off at the mosque, that's where we have meltdowns. Um, we're like, well, there's a shoe rack, but I don't know where to put my shoes. Um, look, you know, I think there's, there's several things that I, I find really amazing about the American Muslim community and the American Muslim experience. And I don't know that it necessarily speaks to other communities, but there are things that, that resonate really deeply with me. Um, one is this very profound idea that's present in Judaism as well, um, but my Muslim experience of it is this idea of universality. Right, that the faith tradition I belong to comes out of, grows out of, and intends to expand this common spiritual experience. And, and I find that really meaningful. Uh, the second thing you know, that I will say, and, and I think this speaks to American Muslims and Jews in this moment, so I don't know who asked the question, so I'm just kind of aimlessly looking around, um, is if we look at the language, you know, Charlottesville is the most egregious example, but, but in general, what's unnerving about this moment to me is that our sort of common narrative as Americans is we were on the right side, and we were, right, of World War II, right? So our, you know, very much the, the, the resonance of American history of the last century is that, 
you know, we fought the good fight. And now you have people who sort of are, you know, valorizing the other side, which is, you know, weird on multiple levels. And what's scary about it is that exactly as you said, it's coming from the top down. Before it was, you know, it, it bubbled up, and it's been a long time since it used to come from the top down, right? We've made tremendous progress as a country. And, and what that actually means, and of course my alarm's gonna go off because I'm smart, um, what that actually means is that we as minorities actually have the ability to influence America on a really deep level because we are America's conscience. Because this isn't just coming up from the bottom anymore, it's coming from the top. Which means those of us who are most vulnerable have the most responsibility uh, because sometimes it's when you're a little bit on the outside or you have an experience of marginalization that you, can, that you can point out to people the dangerousness of what it is they're doing. And that's a scary position to be in. And so I, I think that in this moment, you know, beyond what we can learn from each other, it's about understanding that we have to find a way to trust each other uh, because both of our communities are in serious trouble if we don't do that. Let me do one more here and then one more from the audience, but let me go to a card here. How do you respond to negative comments from people, both Jewish and Muslims, Muslims, um, Islamic people. For example, an acquaintance was very angry that the JCC would host you and Kez and, and uh, Kizer Khan. You know, I, I think it's, and, and this goes back to something that for me is, is a, a spiritual and moral challenge, and I don't mean it's something that you have to constantly try to do, is that, you know, when people come at you angrily, you have to find a way, like, it, the easy thing is to, to push back, right, and, and to be just as angry in return. And Yehuda Kurtzer, who's president of the Hartman Institute, um, where I work, you know, he, he said this to me, and it really resonated with me, and I think it fundamentally transformed me, and I don't mean that lightly. He said, you know, the, the temptation in this moment is that when we see anger, we want to be reciprocally angry, right? Like, well, they're angry at us, and they hate us, so, you know, screw them, we're going to fight back and push back. And he said, actually, I think the moral challenge right now, and he spoke of Jewish communities, but I think he was speaking generally, is to model leadership that is inclusive, that is open, and that is not combative. Because otherwise, you're letting that mode win, and you will never win if that mode wins. And so for me, what's so interesting about that is, you know, I was writing furiously op-eds and policy papers and this and that up to the election of Trump, thinking to myself that this is a disaster, we have to do what we can to stop this, it's bad for America, it's bad for Muslims, you know, it's bad for everyone, right? So the, and, and then, I, you know, when the election happened and I, I read Yehuda say this, I thought to myself, he's right. In that, I mean, I, I don't really see that you convince people by being combative, right? You convince people by taking the time to get to know them. And, and if you can't take the time to get to know them, then you're never gonna hear them. And I'll give you one simple example of how sometimes this happens from the left. Anyone here seen the show Unbreakable, Kimmy Schmidt? On Netflix, yeah, it's a good show, it's a funny show. The only demographic that is made fun of are white Christians. Everyone else, you know, they, they poke fun at, but it's in a very lighthearted and compassionate way. But the white Christian Midwestern characters are a bunch of country bumpkins who we would all be better off without. And imagine if that's what you receive, right? Because that's how people on the right see themselves framed, right? And, and that to me is what's worrying. And so when I, when I get pushback sometimes from Muslims, sometimes from Jewish audiences, you know, I, and I, I'm sorry if I'm going too long, sometimes for me it's about maintaining a sense of humor. Uh, I, I spoke at a university in the Northeast and when they found out I was coming, uh, some of the, the more left-wing groups organized a boycott of me because I, I work for Hartman, which identifies as a Zionist institution. And so then I should be boycotted, and, and this was the first time I got to walk out. So I got up to the stage, I was about to speak, students held up signs, accused me of murdering Palestinian children, and I don't know what else, and then walked out on me. And, and it was a very unsettling moment, because I thought to myself, like, this is a university. Even if you're angry with me, like, stay around and have, an, have, a, have a conversation. If it would have been Berkeley, they wouldn't have walked out, you just wouldn't have been able to speak. Yeah, they would have, they would have booed you and, and shut you down. And I thought to myself, like, that's, that's what I don't like about the boycott language. Like, the whole point of a democracy is to have a conversation. And if the minute you respond to something is, I disagree with you, I'm not going to talk to you, you've just killed the whole idea of a democracy. And so, the, speaking of the humor part, you know, 
Um, towards the end, I made a joke about my Starbucks name and how nobody you know, can pronounce my name, and so I just have to go with, my current Starbucks name is Aaron, because that's my name in English, so I thought, why not? And the student comes up to me, very obviously Middle Eastern, and uh, he says to me, you know, I'm Egyptian, I'm Christian, my name is Peter, I have the opposite problem. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, well, no one thinks my name is Peter, right? <laughs> so he says, you know, he says, sometimes I get a UPS package, and they're like, you know, they'll be like, we have a package for Peter, and he's like, I'm Peter, and they're like, no, you're not. And so he's like, I never get my Amazon packages, it's just, you know, it's a terrible existence, right? And so then he says to me, He's describing this whole story. He goes to Starbucks, and he says, my name is Peter. And they say, no, what's your real name? You can tell us. It's fine. And I turn back, and I said, that's funny, because that never happens to me. Right? I say, my name's Aaron. They're like, OK. And so he's like, that's probably because since you're an older man, they're trying to be respectful. <laughs> and you know, to me, that was more offensive than the walkout. <laughs> I was like, that actually hurt, right? But I guess my point being that, look, you know, I, I get pushback. I get it all the time. You know, in, in some spaces, I'm, you know, I'm too Muslim. In other spaces, I'm not Muslim enough. I went to the 9-11 Museum. I spoke there about a month ago. They got so many death threats that they had 30 or 40 cops out there. And you know, it happens. And, and what are you going to do? Stop doing what you're doing? Well, you've got a good temperament, and that helps. Good set points, uh, if I may say so. Plus, you know, he's been through some personal hell. That always helps you keep, keep you <laughs> humble. I ha so I hand over here. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's nice to see you again. I saw you at the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom in oh, New you. Jersey, and I have the book now that you can sign. So I appreciate I'll sign that. other books too, <laughs> 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 namely Cory Booker's. Right? Um, you mentioned, you know, what's happening today, and whether it's a situation of people just being misinformed versus if it really is a Nazi type movement, and the response would be different depending on which it is. So let's assume it's the first. Mm -hmm. What is the response? I mean, I know for me personally, I, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm shouting into the wind here. Everybody here agrees with me. And the, the few people that don't, you know, we just have to not have, the, it, it's been so fraught with any kind of, with so much tension that we can't have the conversations. And I feel impotent. I look at what's happening. And so what is the suggested response? Assume it is the first example, not the Nazi example. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, and I'll give you what I, what I do and, and, you know, why or how I should say, you know, how it is I hope that that will make a difference is that instead of, you know, one of the things I've, I've tried to do is get off of social media because I don't think it's actually promoting a very positive exchange. Obviously, it has many benefits. But on, on the political front, I think it's dangerous because it, it kind of creates silos. And for me... You know, one of the reasons I work for Hartman, and I love working for Hartman, is because I'm constantly challenged. I mean, we brought this up in terms of political differences, right? I can't get away with, oh, you know, you reject my view of the Middle East. You're just a bad person. I'm never going to talk to you again. No, I see you every day, right? So I see you as a full, like, you're a human being. Like, I hang out with you after work sometimes, right? I attend, I've been to your home. I've had dinner with you. Like, we've had these intense conversations. I can't shut you out. And so for me, it's about finding a space that's different from me, that challenges me, forces me to think more creatively and critically about my own identity, and encourages like deeper learning. And, and I do think that you know, if I could, if I could clone myself, for lack of a better term, like if I had other opportunities, I would do this with other populations, right? Like how do you bridge bridge those communities? And I mean, Salam Shalom is a perfect example of that. And I don't, you know, ultimately, sometimes I think the thing that's scary about it is we do the work and we're like, what difference does it make? Right? Like, like you said, you know, you're, you feel the sense of frustration and, and impotence in a way. But I think that, you know, there's a lot of people doing this. And I'll give you kind of two examples. One is, you know, I, I think that sometimes when we're in this moment, we get disheartened. I think that a lot of young Americans right now are getting politically invested in a way they never would have if the election had gone differently. People would have never studied our democracy, looked at the Constitution, Khizr Khan holding the Constitution up. People wouldn't have had that conversation if not for what's happening. And, and the second thing I'll say by way of something that gives me encouragement is, and this goes, I think, to, to basically your first question, uh, when Trump was elected. So when Trump first proposed the Muslim ban, I freaked out. I'll be totally honest with you. I remember calling a friend in London and being like, is it time to leave? I'm not joking. Because there's part of me that's like, this language is freaking me out, right? Because his candidacy is not going away. Now he's talking about banning people on the basis of their religion, AKA my religion. Um, and then when he won, 
And, and the inauguration happened. I thought to myself, okay, like we're going to have like a slow burn, right? But like Muslim ban came out like three days later, right? And it was a Saturday, I remember, and the airports were in chaos. And I really was like dying inside. Because I said to myself, like, where does this go? And I, am I an idiot for sitting around? And then around 3 or 4 PM that afternoon, and I was sitting, I was living in New Jersey at the time, I was sitting on my couch feeling really despondent. A friend of mine texted me and said, get on Twitter. And I got on Twitter, and I started clicking, and I saw what happened. Thousands of people had showed up at airports all across the country, entirely spontaneously, to push back. And you know, two things came out of that. One, you're not alone. And two, on a very personal level, I didn't hear a word from the Muslim world in protest of this. But everyday Americans, like 99% of whom were not Muslim, were going and protesting on behalf of me. And that was mind blowing. And the reason I say that is because I think that sometimes we get so despondent we think that we're alone. And I think that it's very dangerous to allow ourselves to think that we are alone in that moment. Actually, if I may say, because we've come to the end of this hour, we've actually gone over it. You're not alone. I think people here can attest to that. Um, Thank you. And it's been, um, I, let, let me also, he gave a couple of plugs for the JCC. Let me give a plug for his book. He's going to be signing books. Get the book. It's well worth owning and reading. Thank you. It's a pleasure once again to be with you. And. Um, May whatever force is out there be with you. Thank you. Thank you.